Hey, welcome to another episode of Inspirational Focus with Deacon Terry Acox. Uh, deacon Terry Acox is a Catholic deacon who is going to be talking about the sacrament of holy orders. So stay tuned. Welcome to another episode of Inspiration <laughs> Focus with Deacon Terry Acox. Uh, deacon Terry Acox is a Roman Catholic deacon who has been ordained, uh, who's going to be talking about holy orders, uh, the, one of the sacraments in our series of sacraments. Uh, Terry, it's great to be able to talk with you about the different sacraments. And I would venture to say that this sacrament, Holy Orders, is one of the best for you. Yes, it is, since I have been ordained by the church. <laughs> okay. uh, but we have to remember that all people are called to be ministers in the church, whether that is as a as the lector or as an extraordinary minister of the Holy Eucharist, a youth minister, an organist, choir member, whatever. We're all called to be ministers in the church. Uh, but others of us are called to religious life, like brothers, nuns, monks, these, these type of people are called to religious life, to live a life of, of service in some capacity, like the Dominicans, for example, or teachers, primarily. Um, Called, they're called to a life of service, and they could be uh, a prayer life, you know, praying for the church like a cloistered convent might oh, be. Oh, okay. But I, I, one of the things that I, I noticed you were showing me earlier is that there is a hierarchy of different kinds of clergy. Yes. There are, there are three le levels of hierarchy within the Catholic Church. The, the first level is the deacon. Okay. Uh, permanent deacons, or in some cases, they're referred, some people refer to also as a, as a transitional deacon. A transitional deacon is a deacon who is moving on to the priesthood. I see. I am, in a, I am a permanent deacon, so I will always be a deacon. And, and that's because uh, you are married? That's because I am married, yes. And if, uh, j just out of curiosity, if, if something tragic should happen with your wife, you could then possibly become a priest if you so choose. Is that correct? Well, if the church so chooses. Oh, okay. All right. it, it's entirely up to the church. Nobody has a right to be a deacon or a priest or a bishop. I see. You can merely ask for consideration in that regard, but we do not have that particular right. I see. It's I not see. a right like the right to vote. Oh, okay. All right. So, so in essence, you know, as a deacon, uh, you made, you went through the, uh, what, four years of training? Formation process, yes. Okay. And then you petitioned the, the Catholic Church to see if you no, could... I petitioned Petition the Catholic Church prior to that. Oh, uh, okay. So the basic way it works is <clears throat> the church calls you, you might feel the call from God yourself okay. to join either a religious organization or the diaconate, the priesthood, or whatever. Uh, the church will call you to that after, a, after a period of discernment. Oh, okay. Uh, then they go now, to you. discernment is where you test your faith and you're also the the uh, church also looks at you in well, your formation. I, I would discern whether or not I truly wanted to become I a deacon see. for example okay. and the church at the same time through their their process of, of interviews and testing and stuff they discern if they believe that I have this call also no oh, okay all right well that makes so, sense so it that, works that both makes, ways. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. But anyway, the diaconate or deacon is one order of the, in the hierarchy of the church. The next order is the priesthood. Um, the priest going through the training for priesthood uh, is can be a, is a very lengthy process. Uh, it takes a minimum of six years. Yeah, okay. Uh, if if you have, for example, a degree in. Um, 
chemistry. Mm -hmm. Okay. okay. Uh, it would take you probably six years to go through the entire educational process to be a priest. Uh, it'd be two years of theology and philosophy just to get you basically caught up. Oh, I see. To I where. See. Another individual who was already discerning for the priesthood might have attended uh, a college, say Notre Dame, got a degree in religious philosophy or something of that nature. I see, I see, I see. And I know that we, we have some seminaries like the Pontifical College Josephine in Worthington yeah. that has both a four-year college yes. and a four-year theology. Yes. So that it's conceivable an individual can start as a freshman in college, then it would take him eight years. Eight years, yes. Okay. All right, well, that makes sense. All right. Then, all the while, until you're actually ordained, from even if you started as a freshman in college, you're discerning yourself for the priesthood. Uh, it takes, like I said, a minimum of six, sometimes as many as eight years, or it could take longer. I see. You know, I've, I've known some seminarians who have actually left college, their educational training for a period of time to work in uh, certain organizations to help them discern if they want to yeah. continue with the yeah. priesthood, and, and then they would go back to the educational process. I, I, I would imagine it's a lifelong commitment. It, it is. Uh, and it's not something that you wake up one morning going, hey, I'm going to be a priest, and then that evening... No, no it's, <laughs> it's not like that at all. Uh, but anyway, that's that's the priesthood. Then, then the final order, the hierarchy, is um, the bishop. Oh, okay. Uh, and you have to be a priest before you can be a bishop. I see, I see. So, and that's, that's, I don't know what the process is that the church uses to select one person for a bishop. Um, I'm sure it has to do with your personality, your education, sure. and sure. your effectiveness as a priest and, and so forth. And or, but all bishops are chosen by the Holy Father in Rome. Okay, all right. Uh, they have, there is a special organization there, not organization, group of people who take the names of people, of the priest, and say, is this person um, a potential, a candidate. potential <laughs> candidate for the for the episcopate? Now, now, I, I, I'm quite familiar with the diocese, and uh, you know specifically, uh, we we live in the Columbus diocese. Yes. And there are what five dioceses? There in, are five in dioceses Ohio. in the state of Ohio. Yes. And, and so, uh, you're looking at the fact that you have permanent deacons in the diocese, mm -hmm. uh, covering a number of different churches. You have priests that cover a number of different uh, churches. Right. And then you have one bishop, maybe an auxiliary too. That, if your diocese is large enough, you yeah. may have an auxiliary bishop. Okay, and so that bishop uh, sort of uh, helps the priests uh, to better, best understand their religion, best understand the needs of the diocese. Um, I, I, I really I don't be, know. Oh, okay, uh, but, the, but the bishop is basically is the successor from the apostles that runs the diocese. Okay. He is in charge of the diocese. Okay. Uh, the priests and the deacons work for the bishops. Okay. All right. And they do his bidding at the local parishes. I, I, I understand. And, you know, the, the priest, as, as a priest, I would imagine that following the... the um, religious formations of the bishops and following the needs of the people, it can be really rough on a priest. It can. Um, a priest, I don't think any priest feels that there's enough hours in the day. Yeah. yeah. Uh, they may have, they may go to bed 11, 12 o'clock one night, get a call at 2 o'clock in the morning, somebody's had a heart attack and they need to be anointed and this happens to be a Saturday night so they have to get up and go to Mass Sunday morning to sure. do Mass Sunday morning. So I, I think a lot of priests 
feel that there's not really enough hours in the day. You know, I, I had a, uh, or I have a friend that's a priest, and and one day we were talking, and he had indicated that uh, the one thing that he envied my wife and I was the fact that uh, priests um, always went home to an empty house. And that I was fortunate in the fact that I had somebody to love. Mm -hmm. And that when I would go home, there would be somebody to love me. Well, and, that, and, that is an important part of married life. And it's also an important part of a priestly life. The priest, if you will, is a the head of his household. His household happens to be the parish that he serves. So he actually has all these children, if you will, <laughs> that need him as their religious leader, their spiritual leader. I see. I see. So he, while well, he may go to a house and sit down and watch TV at night, and there's nobody with him, and perhaps another priest if there's another priest there. But then he has to be on, he's on call if you all 24-7. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, 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 it is a, a life of servitude. It is a life of service. And uh, a, a Catholic priest that is a, uh, that has been ordained, is, usually goes to a parish. How many families, and usually families are like 4.1, 4.2, People, if you want to want to use statistics, and we know we can yeah. prove the world's flat statistically, so you can do anything you want with statistics. But uh, how many families usually does a priest help in your church? The largest parish in the Diocese of Columbus. It's St. Paul's Parish, I believe it's St. Paul's Parish in Worthing, uh, Westerville. Westerville. Um, I think there's somewhere on the order of 1,500, 1,600 15. families wow. in that parish. Holy cow. And there were, as far as I can recall, I think there's two, maybe three priests. Oh, wow. That's that's a lot of families that that's have a lot spiritual of families. needs. Now, on the other side of that, uh, a parish can be as, uh, as small as maybe a couple of hundred families. Um, for example, there's a, only one parish in Pike County. Several counties have only one, one church, in one Catholic church in the county. Mm -hmm. And they can be very small parishes. Well, I, you know, one one of the things that I noticed inside a county when we moved down, I grew up in a in a county that only had one church, and I was surprised to see uh, moving down to Scioto County seven churches, mm -hmm. and I know that you, that you uh, minister to six of those. I minister all seven of them. All seven of them on a, on a rotational basis. Yeah, but, yeah. but wow, but. A lot of that has to do with years past, prior to the Diocese of Columbus being formed. For example, on the west side of the county, there's three very small parishes. Mm -hmm. They were originally uh, part of Cincinnati. That's part, of the Cincinnati right. Right. part of the Cincinnati yeah, Diocese. That's right. And they had a, an order of priests that served those particular huh. parishes. And then the Diocese of Columbus was formed and they became part of the diocese. I see. And so, and the, the, there was, in, in, even today, there is a priest that serves those three parishes. I see. And, and so uh, usually on smaller parishes then, from what I understand, a priest will serve two or three, mm -hmm. potentially. Yes. And, and even within uh, uh, the, the priesthood, it's my understanding that there are assistant priests? There are assistant priests. They're called parochial vicars. Oh, okay. Uh, Usually you will see them in, in larger parishes, and sometimes, like in, in the case of um, Syra County here, uh, there's a priest who is a pastor for four different parishes in the county, 
and other parts of the county, and he has a parochial vicar assisting him, so they kind of split that up on a two and two basis. I see, I see. So, so you're able to sort of distribute yourself. Yeah. Uh, what, one of the uh, the things that I often wondered about, and uh, you know, when it, when it comes to being a priest, priests can only be ordained if they are men. Is that correct? That is correct. And uh, women um, are are they ever like, for instance, nuns? Are they? Are, uh, define nuns in the hierarchy of the priesthood. Nuns, nuns and brothers, monks, if you will, are not in the hierarchy of the church. Okay, they are a religious order within the church, and they have their religious order if you will, dictates what they do as far as some orders are teachers, some orders are medical related, like nurses, for example. Some orders will be cloistered and they will they pray for the church and, and other prayers that they are asked to, to assist with. I see. And so they are considered religious. They are considered religious. Okay. And now, uh, yeah. as far as women becoming priests, you know, there was a Pope Paul VI put out a letter several years ago in the 1976 or 77, something like that, in which he said, the church has no authority to ordain women as priests. And, and he, got, he get, went into a, a very lengthy discussion on, on why this was. Uh, for example, it goes all the way back to God being referred to as Father. I see. Father is the, the leader of the family, the protector of the family. Now, there is a place in the church for women. Um, several, there have been a couple women, uh, St. Teresa of Avila, um, and I can't think of another one, but uh, they are doctors of the church. They have written documents of such faith that they are considered oh, okay. that way. Right. On the same as um, St. Thomas Aquinas or, or um, St. Ignatius, you know, they're doctors of the church. I see. I see. Uh, so the, the, there is a, a, a purpose, uh, there's a role for women to fulfill in the church. But if you look, who do you think is in heaven is the second most is the yeah the second most powerful person in heaven? Uh, I would say Jesus. Well, person, a uh, uh, human person. Uh, oh, okay. I'm sorry, a human person. Oh, okay, uh, Mary. The Blessed Virgin Mary. Right. We have a here. We have the example of a woman who is the most perfect person on earth. Okay. She was born without sin. Okay. All right. She never sinned in her life. Okay. She was never tempted to sin. Okay. And Jesus did not include her in the priesthood. He, he felt that he chose 12 apostles, 12 men to be the, the, the beginning of the priesthood. And, they, and from them, they were the original bishops, if you will. And from them, the bishops have been, okay. come, have been um, have followed him. Okay, all right. So, so um, you know, since Christ established the priesthood, if you want to call it yes. that. Yes. Uh, and... Uh, you know, since all of the different apostles or bishops, if you want to want to call it that, went to various different lands to spread the word, um, I, I, I'm assuming that they felt they needed a one guiding person to help all of those bishops, and that was the Pope. Yes, and that was uh, Saint Peter. The original Pope was Saint Peter. Okay, uh, Jesus, and the Scripture supports this because. Jesus Jesus tells us that he gives St. Peter the keys to the kingdom. Okay. And, and also to St. Peter and the other apostles, he says that I give to you the power to hold sins, uh, bind sins to people or to loose the sins okay. from the people. He gives these people the, the responsibility and the authority to forgive sins. Okay. 
Yeah. And this uh, comes from Christ himself. Well, now that now that you brought that up, uh, you know, we, we're talking about the seven sacraments. Mm -hmm. And a priest, uh, it's my understanding, can administer all seven of those sacraments. No. No. A priest cannot ordain people. Oh, okay. Right. The ordinary minister of ordination, either both deacons and priests, is the bishop. Oh, okay. All right. All right. So that that is the one sacrament that is reserved for the bishop. Oh, okay. Now a priest can administer all the other sacraments. Okay. And indeed, a deacon can even can administer the sacrament of baptism. He can witness marriages, um, and that's it as far as the sacraments are concerned. I see. I see. So there is, but the the ordination of bishops and priests is retained by the bishop. Okay. All right. Well, well oh, that, I oh, guess that makes sense. Oh, yeah. <laughs> also, confirmation is normally retained for the bishop, but the bishop does have the authority to delegate it, for example, at the Easter Vigil at all the different parishes and dioceses. Okay. Then the priest, with that delegation, can confirm people. Okay. Uh, Something that I, I always wondered about, within a priest, you also have what is called a monsignor okay. and a regular priest. Right. Um, I, I often wondered why that designation, monsignor, went to certain... Uh, a monsignor, a cardinal, if you will, uh, these are honorific titles. Oh, okay. Uh, it is a Monsignor is a priest who has done exceptional work in leading his particular parish, oh, or maybe written some documents that I have see. been published and, and that kind of thing. <laughs> so he would be given a the honorific of Monsignor. The same thing with archbishops and cardinals. An archbishop is the leader of an archdiocese, but a cardinal is basically a priest, a bishop, that has been given an honorific oh, title okay. right. to because okay. of the work he's done for the church. I see. So you, you have so many cardinals, and, and they are all, all over the world, or do they live in... They are all over the world. And occasionally they get together and they have synods? They have synods. And um, uh, also, when if there happens to be a passing of a pope, they are there to elect they, they come together to elect oh. the next pope oh, upon okay. the... Upon the either in the case of Pope Benedict the Sixteenth, his resignation, or in the case of uh, all the other um, popes, in the case of their death, then the cardinals will come together and elect the next pope. You, you bring up, and I, I didn't uh, uh, pre-ask this, but how did how did the popes select names? I mean, I, I understand about John Paul. You know, how does the pope select the cardinals? Select their names. Names like uh, Pope Paul oh, VI. Okay. Or, do, okay. do you know, I, I always wanted to know. Uh, I really don't know, but I can hazard a guess. Okay. Uh, there's something about, for example, Pope Francis. Mm -hmm. There was. Uh, I think was his his given name. Uh, I forget his first name. But anyway, when he was elected pope, there, there was something obviously about Saint Francis I that see. he admired I and see. he wanted to emulate in his papacy. I so see. he chooses the name of Francis. So, so all popes choose their names. They're, it's not designated by. They choose their names. Oh, okay. Yes. All right. Uh, we, we only have a few minutes, and I keep on interrupting you with, with questions, etc. But um, you know, with the holy orders, etc., and the, the the priests, what are some some things that you have found the priests helping the different people? You, you know, in in their in the church, in their in the churches that you go, the priests are looked upon as a spiritual teacher. There's a spiritual leader of the parish. And, and you know, what what are some some things that you found uh, within your your life that that priests have really helped with? Well, lots of different things, um, especially. 
problems, if you will. Okay. Um, a lot of people throughout their life, married, married and single, they will periodically have problems. Let's say my wife and I are having a problem. Okay. Uh, some some difficulties arrived in our marriage has arisen in our marriage. Uh, one or both of us may go to the priest and say, I see. "Father, we have this problem that I need help with," and he would then counsel me in some manner, I see. I see. saying. Uh, you might try this or you might do that, okay. but always try prayer. Hmm. You know, yeah, prayer, I, I, prayer is I, the one thing that is common with basically everything that we can do that we can never pray enough no, that, that make, to, that make to some, help us with our good times and bad times. Sure, and I would imagine you know one of the most tragic things is death of a of a child, a spouse, a father, you know, things of that nature. And, and, then, are there and in cases like that, then obviously the priest is, can be a tremendous help. Yeah, and giving them solace. And, you know, right. But, um, and I, I would also imagine in the sacrament of, of reconciliation, yes. they help heal some of the hurts that that individual. The, yes. Um, Whenever we sin, regardless of the whether it's a venial sin or a mortal sin, we separate ourselves from God. I see. And in the sacrament of reconciliation, that brings us back to and heals that relationship that yeah. we have with God. Yeah, yeah. And uh, you know, once we have that healing, it also makes us a better person. Yes, yeah. because we are we are told in in the sacrament of reconciliation. That by the priest, that he is by the authority given to him by the church, okay. which the church was established by Jesus Christ, then he has the authority from Jesus Christ to forgive sins. I see. I see. Okay. And human beings, being what they are, we can always want to hear that we have been forgiven. Yeah. You know, that goes a long way in our own psyche as to whether or not that heals us mm -hmm. in a way. For example, if I should say to you, I've, I've done something to you, and I... So you're the one that so let I, the air out of my tires. And I, and I go <laughs> off in a corner someplace and I say, Patrick, please forgive me. What good does that do? That's true. That's true. Yeah. That makes sense. Uh, Ray, we're, we're talking with uh, Deacon uh, Terry Acox. Uh, Terry Acox is a, uh, a permanent deacon, Roman Catholic Church, uh, inside a county in which he covers seven counties. Um, uh, he, he has uh, uh, been a deacon for how many years? Six years. Six years. And he continues to serve the needs, the spiritual needs of uh, those individuals in those different churches. I want to thank everyone for uh, viewing and listening. Terry, it's always a pleasure being able to talk with you. It's a pleasure being here. Uh, so until next time, thank you for viewing and listening.